Thanks for tuning in to another Better FAQ video series. Today I want to talk about your client agreement versus your independent contractor agreement versus your partner agreement or vendor agreement. The main gist of this video is to basically outline that agreements are not one size fits all. They should be very much tailored to the relationship that you need that agreement for. Now, Another helpful thing I think for thinking about agreements is thinking about them like a road or a roadway. Some agreements are one way. Most agreements are going to be a two-way street. What I mean by that is let's think about a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement. If you present one of those to someone and you have them sign it so that they don't share your confidential information, they don't disclose that after you disclose it to them, that's a one-way street, right? That means that the obligation is purely on them not to share your information. But most agreements, on the other hand, you're going to give somebody money, they'll give you services, or maybe they give you money, you give them services. It's a two-way street. Now, because of that, the only agreement that I think I would ever say is going to be sort of a blanket agreement that you can use in many different situations is that NDA, one of those confidentiality agreements. That's one that you can really use if it is tailored to the type of information that you don't want disclosed, you don't want to give somebody an NDA that says, hey, don't share all of my technical data if you're sharing with them drawings about uh, a book that you're making. But an NDA, if tailored properly, is something that you can use in a wide variety of relationships. You can give an NDA to a contractor so they don't share your business information. You can give one to an employee. You can give one to a partner. You can give one to your client even so they don't share your process and your inner business workings. Uh, however, pretty much every other agreement is a two-way street, and that means that there are many different nuances, things that are between the lines, things that are very important that you have tailored specifically to that type of relationship. You should be tweaking every agreement in every individual relationship and engagement with that particular party for that particular agreement, but the agreement should also be set up for those types of relationships or engagements. So let's say, for instance, independent contractor agreement. If you're hiring an independent contractor, your independent contractor agreement should be set up, A, to make sure that it's compliant and that you're not inadvertently hiring an employee. Whole other can of worms. Watch our labor and employment videos on that one. But it also needs to include whether they can share information you give them, whose intellectual property is being used, if, it has, if there's a license for that intellectual property, or are you giving ownership? Are they then giving you ownership of something they create if they're working on any type of creative work or intellectual property? Because, fun fact, the default application of law is that a contractor owns any creative work that they develop, even if you hire them to do it. So you have to make sure that your agreement says, no, no, whatever I hired you to create, I own. So that is going to be different, however, then let's say if you are a creative professional and you have an agreement with your client and you don't give ownership to your client, well, you need to make sure you have a license in your agreement to give the license to your client for that intellectual property. Or if you do want to give ownership because you're also considered a contractor even though you're a vendor, so it's just a 1099 versus a W9, if you are going to actually give ownership of creative content that you make for your client, that needs to be reflected in your agreement. Otherwise, you own it, they don't, and then they can get into hot water if, let's say, for instance, they are having you create a piece of a larger creative work that they then give to their client, but because it wasn't in your agreement with them, they don't have ownership, and that causes them issues. So, again, those are two sort of minor examples, maybe not so minor. Uh, a contractor agreement, you need to have terms, language, and things in there that are favorable to you as the person hiring the contractor. Uh, like for instance, I said compliance, who owns the intellectual property, but then it actually can be flipped around completely if you are then the contractor providing services to your client or customer. You want to make sure then that that road, those sort of terms go more in your favor to you about ownership, NDA, you know, the different things that you would want to have in your agreement for your customer or client, like when you work, do you work after hours? Do you have rush fees? What are the delivery dates? What if they don't deliver something for you? And these are all the things that most likely are more unique to your agreement with your client. 
Now, what about a partner? Well, a partner or a vendor, and I'm not using partner in the sense of like an, a legal partnership here. I mean, maybe you work on something together with another company, a joint campaign, a joint product, something along those lines. Well, a joint campaign or a joint product, great example. You're both going to develop intellectual property. Maybe one of you hosts it on your website and the other doesn't. Maybe you link back and forth. You know, who's going to handle the refunds, the purchases, who does host those, who owns it if the other party's hosting it. What if you're using each other's intellectual property, you don't have anything in that agreement, and then all of a sudden they think they own some of your intellectual property, or they take your logo or something along those lines. That's also going to be a different scenario than an agreement that you might have with a contractor because that contractor might not be providing any of those types of services for you. And again, each situation is different. For a contractor, you want to make sure that you're setting the parameters, setting the terms, and that you dictate ownership of things like intellectual property. Now, if you have clients and you're giving them your agreement, you then want to make sure that your time is protected, your intellectual property is licensed or owned appropriately with that client, that you have rush fees and payment terms and termination uh, things in there. I'm recording this during July 2020, so maybe you need a force majeure clause in case COVID keeps up. You know, if you're an event planner, these agreements look dramatically different if it's for your client versus the person helping you set up and break down the event. Also, with a partner, if you're a planner, maybe somebody comes in to do the floral. Well, you don't want to be responsible for someone hurting themselves or eating a flower and getting food poisoning. I don't know if that happens. But you want to make sure that's in your agreement with your partner, which most likely is not something that you need in your agreement with the person breaking down the event or your actual client that hired you to plan the overall wedding. So these are just a few small examples of how agreements should be different based on the type of engagement, who the parties are, what is being exchanged, and it's very important that you don't try to use the same agreement across the board for all of these scenarios because let's take another example for instance of where maybe you used an independent contractor agreement for your client instead of a client agreement. Well, if your independent contractor agreement assigns all ownership and it also doesn't have an NDA, it doesn't have any parameters around your time, it doesn't have any termination sections, no force majeure in there about COVID or any type of acts of God, well, you could find yourself in a situation where you accidentally assign all of your ownership of all of your intellectual property to your client, you cannot terminate the agreement, the payment terms are atrocious, you do not have the ability to suspend the contract if you're ill. So there's very, very real practical reasons for making sure that the agreement you use for specific scenarios is designed for those specific scenarios. We didn't even touch on this video on agreements for speaking engagements. Maybe agreements where you're just doing some fundraising for a nonprofit organization. That requires registration, by the way. Or different types of things with giveaways and sweepstakes and contests. Those are also different types of agreements. We didn't talk at all about click wrap and browser wrap agreements which live online for online purchases or digital streaming events. Those are tailored to those situations. So this is just hopefully driving home the point that don't just grab an agreement that just has random terms that seem broad and general enough from the internet and use it for everything. You're going to get yourself in trouble. At the very least, you're going to get into a disagreement someday and you're going to be left with very little, if not no, recourse because of that agreement. The agreement is where you go when there's a disagreement and it hopefully helps resolve it because the agreement's drafted for that scenario. So, a little bit rambly on the different scenarios, different examples, different types of situations, but I do hope that this drives the point home that you need a specific agreement for specific situations. Probably the only general template that I would condone is an NDA, and most likely there I would even say it should be a mutual NDA, so a two-way street where you're both protecting each other's information. So, hope this was helpful. Hope you have a good day. See you soon.